Well, hi everyone. We are about to start the fourth session for the festival to fight inequality. So welcome everybody. We know a lot of people is coming from another sessions and there's a lot still to enjoy and to take part in this festival today and tomorrow. So we appreciate to having uh, this time to reflect, to exchange with you, with these two advocates that I advocates that I will introduce uh, shortly, but also to, to hear uh, from everyone that is joining us in the session. First of all, my name is Eva La Rosa. I'm with the Coalition for Human Rights in Development. And we will have a session today with Sonia Palazze from the Institute for Economic Justice and also Alison Corky from the Center for Economic and Social Rights. Welcome, both of you. It will be great to hear uh, this uh, debate, this exchange about the role of human rights uh, for advancing economic justice, to know how um, this can be together, the agendas, and to see how are, are the gaps and why this is something that we often identify that is a need to, to exchange and to know more how to use the, the agenda, the discourse, the knowledge, the experience and the practices of these two uh, worlds in a way. So just uh, to a uh, brief introduction, Sonia is a researcher, an economist in the Institute and her research focus is at the intersection of gender and climate justice and human rights. Alison is the director of strategy and learning at the Center for Economic Social Rights and her work focuses on how research can support advocacy to tackle inequality. Today uh, we will have uh, the session will be the session will be guided by some questions to start the, the exchange the debate and also all the participants will be able to respond some questions that we will post in the chat and of course please feel free to raise your hand if you if you want to intervene and post also your own questions not only to respond the, the ones we will post to to encourage the exchange, but also your questions while we are uh, advancing in this conversation to build this knowledge, to build new ways to work this in, among these collective efforts. Uh, so we hope we, to, we will have a really good session today. So maybe just to use uh, a question for you to know more, a little bit more about our two speakers today, I will uh, do this question for you both. What gives you, gives you hope in your work um, regarding the issues that we are working? Please, Alison, you can can you go first? Sure. Um, thanks, Siva. I think one thing that gives me hope is just seeing how much more interest there is about the issue of um, how the economy relates to human rights and how the economy impacts on human rights and how much more how much bolder um, activists are being and really questioning economic policy decisions. Um, when I started working with the center over 10 years ago, there was I think, still generally kind of a widespread idea that like economic issues are for economists um, and human rights activists, that's not our issue to, to weigh in on. And I've really seen a big change in, in energy and interest around this topic. And that really gives me a lot of hope. Thank you, Alison. Well, we want to hear about, about this, Sonia. What gives you hope in your work and on all this? Thanks, Eva. Um, there's a lot, honestly, that doesn't give me hope. Um, and sometimes I feel like there is more to be to not be hopeful for than there is to be hopeful for. But I'm, I'm always reminded of, um, of James Baldwin's idea of re revolutionary hope. Um, and when he said that we are each other's hope and um, in working in spaces with young, brilliant activists and thinkers, um, particularly in the climate justice space, gives me a lot of hope because we are asking important questions and we are disrupting the status quo and collectively reimagining our world where all systems of oppression are dismantled. Um, and of course, platforms like this, like the inequality fight inequality festival, I find give me a, um, a nice burst of jo joy and, and hope. Thank you, Sonia. You both are right. And especially we hope with these sessions, we will help to build also other narratives 
to, to disrupt the common uh, or the usual thing how we see uh, sometimes in silos, but to be able to join our fights, our work, and be able to move forward uh, our agenda for justice, for economic justice, and, and a dignified life for everyone. Let's see, we invite everyone to see a short, really short, uh, an excellent video to frame a little bit the, the conversation today. Go ahead with the video, please. What would our world look like if we prioritise people and planet, not profit and plunder? What if we designed our economies to guarantee human rights for all? Right now, our economic system works to benefit the few, not the many. To empower corporations, not communities. But what if we did things differently? What comes to mind when you think of human rights? Dignity? Equity? Justice? Our economies can make it easier or harder to achieve these things. Shaped by decades of struggle by activists around the world, human rights entitle every person to the conditions they need to flourish. Why is talking about rights important? Because when something is a right, it means it is too fundamental to be left to the arbitrary choices of public officials or to the whims of the unregulated market. It's a public good governments must protect, not a privilege or a commodity. In this way, centering human rights directly challenges our current market-driven, corporate-dominated economic model. That's why we're creating a vision for a rights-based economy. In a rights-based economy, success would mean providing a dignified life for all people and dismantling inequality, fostering solidarity instead of competition between individuals and between countries, respecting planetary boundaries and working in harmony with nature advancing economic and environmental justice on a global scale and redressing historical wrongs. Armed with a progressive vision based on human rights, we can build a new, fairer economic system in the wake of COVID-19. If you want wealthy people and powerful corporations to pay their fair share, if you think care work should be valued and supported rather than taken for granted, if you demand living wages for all and public services in public hands, join us. Read the report by the Centre for Economic and Social Rights and Christian Aid and help us to build a blueprint for a rights-based economy. Thank you. Thank you, Alka Osvando, also, that is helping with uh, all the technical issues with the video. And also, she's putting some questions in the chat for us to uh, get this dynamic of exchanges. Let's see, uh, let's start with the first reactions about the video and how uh, this makes a strong case or, or not for human rights as a tool to tackle economic inequality. Sonia, can you go first? Yes, thanks. Um, I think the video does a really good job of highlighting kind of the various um, gaps between a, a human rights based economy and, you know, the mainstream economics that is so pervasive today, you know, the way that we are doing economics clearly prioritizes profit over people, you know, it is exploitative of our natural world for the sake of economic growth and so forth. And um, the video got me thinking about, you know, the country where I'm from, South Africa, where arguably our constitutional framework is, you know, celebrated globally as one of the most progressive in the world. You know, we have the, the Bill of Rights, which is the cornerstone of our democracy, that is very clear about the range of political, economic and civil rights um, afforded to every South African. But the reality um, for so many, so many South Africans is so different to the ideals outlined in the Bill of Rights um, or any kind of internationally recognized human rights treaty, uh, treaties that South Africa is a signatory to. And, you know, the reason for this is that our macroeconomic choices have failed us. Um, and the reason why I say this is because our economic policies reflect kind of global mainstream approaches to economics. Um, and the problem with you know, made this approach 
to mainstream economics, um, and there are many <laughs> problems, but you know, relevant to this discussion is that you know, it doesn't acknowledge its role in meeting human rights obligations. And so questions of distribution or redistribution of wealth are kind of conveniently sidelined in favor of um, you know, GDP growth, for example. So while we have you know, amazing kind of human rights foundations, um, policy, economic policy choices like the move to liberalization um, in the early 90s, which is a hallmark of kind of mainstream economics um, that has kind of <coughs> spoken about in that video, um, led to widespread job losses um, and you know, opened the path towards deindustrialization. It opened the path to privatization and the commodification of access to basic economic rights. And um, these entrenched economic orthodoxies, I think, are central to the lack of economic justice we see today. Um, I'm reminded of Manuel Branco, who wrote that a deterioration in human rights is not the outcome of doing the right economics wrongly, but of doing the wrong economics rightly. Um, so it is then not surprising that an economy that fixates on economic growth by methods of you know, exploiting national resources will not respect planetary boundaries because that is not what the system is to designed to do. And you know, an economy that views the private sector or corporations as the most efficient provider of public services will inevitably lead to the erosion of public services and the shrinking and shirking of the role of the state. Um, you know, and as many feminist economists have pointed out, an economy that overlooks social reproductive work is you know, fundamentally flawed because it dismisses the important roles that women play in the economy that is you know, unrecognized, unpaid, or underpaid or completely invisibilized. So my last point is you know, mainstream economics as we know it today cannot achieve economic justice that is grounded in a human rights underpinning. And you know, the two are very linked. I mean, what, what do we mean by economic justice? I think part of what we're fighting for, as you were saying earlier, Ivana, is you know, economic justice is about ensuring that every human being has all the necessary elements for a life of dignity. You know, these two are the values of human rights. So a rights-based economy described in that video, I think requires us to radically rethink and redo our, our economic policies. Thank you, Sonia. You bring a lot of things that are really, really key. Also, Alison, can you, what are the, the reactions about the video and, and the things that we start discussing? Sure. Um, so to answer the poll question in the chat, I think mine would be D, um, which would surprise probably no one, um, given that this is the area that, that, that my work focuses on so strongly. Um, but I think Sonia's point is really important about when you know, one thing the video highlighted is the big gap between the status quo um, and, and where we want to be. Um, and so I want to spend a few minutes kind of picking up some of the ideas in, in the video that I think tell us something about how can rights help us close that gap? You know, how can we use them as a, as a tool in our advocacy and our activism to try and close that gap? Um, so first of all, the video makes the point that the way our economies are designed make it easier or harder for people to secure the conditions that they need for a good life. You know, our economies aren't neutral or mechanical in the way that they distribute, it, that they distribute resources, which is the argument that we often hear from, from mainstream economists. So in this way, drawing on rights can really help us strengthen our arguments about the injustice of the current economic model. Um, and in our work at CSR, we talk a lot about um, economic inequality, both within countries and, and between countries, being a cause and a consequence of human rights violations. So making those links very directly. You know, as a cause of human rights violations, we can see that economic inequality sustains poverty and sustains the precarious living conditions for many. You know, I was reading a headline earlier today about how the rich can breathe easier than the poor, um, given um, the, the, the condition, the quality, the air quality in different um, in different locations. 
And of course, these disparities play out very often along gendered and along um, racialized lines. And as we've seen through the global COVID-19 pandemic, you know, that's, there's, that's a really glaring example of, of, of this. Um, but economic inequality is also a consequence of human rights violations. Um, and as Sonia emphasized, a lot of um, the drivers of economic inequality are deliberate policy choices that governments have made. Um, choices like collecting less tax from wealthy individuals or like privatizing public services or like eroding workers' rights. Um, and what we would argue in our work is that these are choices that actually breach the obligations and the commitments that governments have made to protect people's rights. So that's the first thing, the economy is not neutral. Um, exactly. I, I, I think another really important point the video makes is that human rights are shaped by decades and decades of struggle by activists. Um, and to me, that really emphasizes that human rights are a very multi-dimensional concept. They don't just mean one thing. You can see them in different ways, in different contexts. Um, and a lot of times we think about human rights as legal obligations. You know, as Sonia said, they're enshrined in constitutions or they're, um, so they're in treaties that governments have signed up to. Um, but, but I think thinking about rights more expansively kind of offers us more um, when we unpack the role they can play in advancing economic justice. You know, and in particular, you know, we can see rights as moral claims. Um, and there's a video emphasis, emphasizes um, rights give force to values like dignity and equity and justice. And they assert that there are certain material conditions that are so essential for us as human beings to flourish that they have to be universally recognized. Um, and rights can also shape public debate be, by being used as political demands. Um, in, in political debates, you, you know, drawing on rights stresses that well-being should be prioritized when making policy decisions and when deciding on trade-offs about who, how resources are distributed. Um, and the last point I want to make is that the video really stresses that human rights are so fundamental that they have to be guaranteed. Um, and this, this is something I want to pick up a little bit more as, as the conversation continues, but basically what this is saying is that when someone has a right, someone else has a duty um, to, to give effect to that right. And that might be a duty to do something, or it might be a duty to not do something. Um, and, and in this way, rights can be a powerful framing for the economic demands that communities are making. You know, rather than saying, we want the municipality to fix our roads, or we want this factory to stop polluting, we're actually saying, no, this is an obligation. This is something that they must do because if they don't, they're violating our rights. Of course, whether that argument is listened to or not um, is another question. And there's, there's a, lot of, of, a lot of factors that, that will determine that. Um, but because of the duties that, that flow from rights, you know, I think they do really influence the political economy um, of decision-making and they shape the rules of the game in the way that you know, different groups um, in society bargain for economic power. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Sonia. Um, you both bring a lot of things that are really key to start warming up <laughs> this debate. Uh, and of, of course, uh, I think about things that you bring, no? the system, how it's shaped so far, how is the mainstream approach to economy in the global, uh, globally. So how with these, uh, these tools, these rights, and all the development about economic justice, all from the feminist, all from these struggles, we can, again, reshape also the narrative and to give teeth about what it means or what entitles all these obligations uh, these actors, governments have, but also other actors that are playing really hard also and impacting uh, the, the realization of human rights. So uh, let's see in, as a second question, maybe, uh, and you, you both mentioned a little bit about this, but with, what are the doubts that you have or that you see in this work to, to advance our agendas for a social world, world with social justice, with human rights being respect and, and accomplished really. What are the doubts that you see or you have, or you see in the, when we are working with other uh, in the world or facing uh, especially these powerful actors that we need to, to influence? Uh, what would be these, these doubts that you, you will mention and, and to see how to, to respond? 
let's start by you, Alison, now, and then with Sonia. I'm going one one. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think gaps and and challenges. What 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 are what are some of the things that we have to think about, and maybe blind spots that we have to address better if if to, to sharpen human rights as a, as a tool for tackling economic inequality. Um, and I want to come back to this idea of, of duties, because on the one hand, I said, you know, that's the strength of rights is that they have duties that, that, that attach to them. But it is the case that when it comes to the economy and, the, and when it comes to economic policy making, those duties are generally a lot less clear. Um, so, for example, if someone's rights are violated because they've been evicted from their house, we know more or less kind of who has to do what to fix that problem. Um, but if someone's rights are violated because there are chronically high unemployment rates or because droughts and flooding is getting worse, you know, who has to do what is a lot harder to define. Um, and so I think in, for, for kind of quite a lot of mainstream human rights work, we've tended to stay on safer ground. Um, we, we focused on those more extreme cases where there really is very clear interference with people's rights. But what that has meant is that we've tended to be documenting symptoms rather than analyzing systems um, as effectively as we could be. Um, and another, another challenge or another gap that I think is really important to talk about is that when there has been efforts to define what those duties are, um, for the most part, they've tended to be quite legalistic and, and quite technical. They've been seen as the domain of, of legal experts. Um, and that's made them less accessible and, and less useful for activists, both in terms of, of diagnosing the problems that they're working on and identifying solutions for, for addressing them. Um, so I want to spend a couple minutes just kind of outlining what those duties are, because I think that's helpful in taking forward um, this discussion. And I'm going to link it back to this bargaining idea to kind of highlight why these duties matter in, in, in shaping um, economic struggles. So I'm going to use inverted commas when I'm talking about legal standards, because sometimes the specific words do matter. Um, but I'm going to do my best to, to explain that jargon um, when, it, when it does come up. <laughs> Um, so, so first of all, so, so what duties, what, how do duties shape the conditions in which bargaining takes place? Um, the main duties relate to kind of policy making processes and procedures. So human rights principles require, for example, that policy making be participatory, that it be transparent and that it be accountable. And there's a range of rights like freedom of assembly, the right to protest, the right to access information um, that enable that participation um, by different groups and different um, communities. Um, and sometimes those rights are given effect through things like consultation processes or um, the, the requirement to give consent or um, opportunities for public input into policy making processes. So there, there's, there's kind of rules set around how, how decisions are made. Um, second, human rights duties um, affect the relative bargaining strength of different groups because they set out who's entitled to what and who's obligated to do what to, to guarantee that entitlement. So rights entitle everyone to the material conditions essential for dignity and well-being, um, but they set a floor, they don't set a ceiling. There's not just, there's not a cap on, on what those conditions look like. This means that the full realization of socioeconomic rights has to be progressively achieved. Essentially, this demands a continued improvement in people's lives and on the reverse that conditions shouldn't be getting worse. Um, it also means prioritizing the needs of disadvantaged groups and those that are facing systemic and intersectional forms of discrimination. So those are the entitlements in terms of what people can be demanding and asking for. Um, and on the other hand, it also presents corresponding obligations of what, what, what do governments have to do to make sure those entitlements are, are realized. And there's, there's a three part um, typology for that. Um, the first is that they respect people's rights, um, meaning treating people fairly and humanely, that they protect people's rights, meaning taking action um, to prevent and punish abuses by, by, by non-government actors, and in particular, the corporate sector, um, which Eva mentioned. 
And the third is that there, there's, a, there's a duty to fulfill people's rights. I'm going to bring that in inverted commas. Um, and what that means is taking steps to facilitate access to goods and services. Um, and that might include providing them directly in some cases. But a really important qualification on these obligations is that governments must take steps to the maximum of their available resources to fulfill people's rights. And this, this is a really important standard in thinking about how human rights can contribute to economic justice and to the redistribution of resources. Um, because it sets out criteria for judging the way that governments raise, allocate and spend money. Um, now, I think there's definitely more work to be done in terms of defining how these duties can be leveraged and how they can help shape demands for action, um, in particular when it comes to action that's required to address climate change. Um, but I think a really important starting point is making these more widely understood and accessible and used um, across a range of social justice activists um, and not just kept in the domain of like, legal um, expertise. Thank you, Alison. Well, you bring also a lot of things. Sonia, what about you about the dabs that you see or you have or especially in this now thinking about the economy and how economic policy are framed and all the system, we often uh, see that all these principles, all these standards are not taken into consideration in most of the countries. Let's see what, yeah. what you think about the, these dabs, how we can tackle this. <laughs> Um, thank you. I mean, just on the question that was posed in, in the chat first um, around like what ways human rights helped, you know, in your work, I think, you know, human rights for me have been um, powerful claims to access. I think there's something really powerful about saying, you know, everyone has a right to health, everyone has a right to housing and these are not kind of lofty pie in the sky goals. No, this is something that every person, everyone has a right to. These are our birthrights. So, you know, in my work within the economic justice space, human rights, I think, are a natural basis or framework from, from which to advocate for kind of better economic outcomes. And this is not, you know, something that is, you know, we're not talking about this in the abstract. Um, and I think human rights are really useful to make strong arguments for the importance of economic justice, um, as Alison also articulated so well. Um, and on this question about doubts, you know, I don't, I don't think that I have like particular um, doubts about the potential for for using human rights as a tool to tackle economic inequality. I mean. I think it goes without saying that our economic choices would be, I think, very different if the objective of these policies was first and foremost to ensure that we meet human rights obligations as opposed to, you know, meeting kind of GDP targets or, you know, increasing greater foreign direct investments, um, as an example. Um, I do have kind of reservations or questions about human rights and its compatibility, I guess, with kind of big questions about redistribution, um, questions about reparations for past economic injustices. You know, African countries have really strong cases for, rep for reparations given historical economic injustices. And, you know, and of course the role that big businesses primarily from the global north have played in, you know, plundering our natural resources, you know, while the wealth that came from that resource extraction and exploitation is enjoyed by, you know, very few portion of the population, you know, while also socializing the risks of their actions, um, like we're seeing today with climate change. Um, and I guess one of the things I keep thinking about, you know, and thinking about the language of human rights is that, you know, it seems to me that you know, human rights kind of accepts that the world that we're living in is unjust and gives, you know, clear avenues for making the status quo more accountable, like we spoke about earlier. Um, so human rights are very clear about the obligations, you know, that Alison spoke about, the obligations that states, for example, have in ensuring that rights are enacted. Um, however, there are very kind of few human rights frameworks that I know of that clearly 
articulates or shows how we make certain states accountable to past injustices or obliges states to enforce reparations. And I think this is an important question when, when thinking not only about what we mean by economic justice, but what we envision as a rights-based economy. Does this mean that we, you know, we learn from our, our histories or you know, does it mean that we just move towards the vision of a rights-based economy? Um, you know, similarly, I mean, this is, this is also like particularly relevant within the climate justice space. I think you know, the fight for climate justice has opened very important questions, very important debates about you know, whether the human rights of future generations should be thought about now. You know, if we know for sure that our actions today will directly impact their enjoyment of their human rights in the future. Um, and so how, how can human rights help us take stock of our histories and how does it make us accountable to our past and future generations? Um, and I think that should also be explicitly defined you know, as part of our human rights and um, an economic justice agenda and, and discourses currently. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. Yes, sure. I think, uh, again, you both are bringing things that are clear, that is not just repeat uh, the human rights, uh, the rights we have in the covenants or the rights we have in the Universal Declaration is, is, is more about how we use this exactly to challenge this systemic inequality and to challenge the usual way in which the war is, is built. Uh, and as you mentioned also, um, Sonia, about learning uh, from our history, learning about the processes, learning how different actors have been playing in other parts of the world with oppression, taking the resources. Um, and of course, as you also mentioned, uh, Alison, using the standards, but also the standards are built from the struggles of the people, are, are evolving every time. And we are with all the struggles providing new meaning and now uh, like trying to situate in, in the in the day to day. So that's why uh, it, it seems really, really important to learn from each other, to learn and to provide more weight in the in how we frame this, this demand, but also how we challenge and we are learning and thinking all the time. So Let's see also from, from, the, from the chats, people are, are sharing how the human rights uh, uh, framework is useful for their, their struggle, for their work. Uh, Sergio is sharing about the fiscal policy, how we challenge, as you also mentioned, Sonia, about the GDP and both mentioned about redistribution. Some, so often the, the goals are about the GDP in a country, but that doesn't mean that people will get the equal opportunity to develop uh, because it's, it's, if you are not thinking on the redistribution. Um, so to, to a new system, maybe <laughs> to, to try to have this, this fair share from everyone and to not to use everything as a commodity. Also, you mentioned, you both mentioned that. Um, let's see the, the third question to continue this debate. Uh, how can we really are able to build this common ground? Because you already brought a lot of things and we clearly see how important it is to know from what all the economic uh, justice movement are developing, from all the climate movement are developing, all the thinking from the human rights uh, also feel, uh, well, all these activists that are merging in a way these things, but how, can we build this common ground between in this in this question both world of economic justice and human rights? Sonia, can you go with this as a continuation? Yes, yes, thank you. I think you know the 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 biggest challenge, you know, and I think Alison spoke about this as well, is you know, or Eva, I'm not sure, is getting kind of multiple, you know, voices, multiple disciplines in the room to kind of link these themes together. I think that has been one of the biggest challenge, challenges. So, you know, getting economists and policymakers to think about human rights and vice versa, 
um, because often these conversations have been had in, in silos. And also, you know, the question of accessibility, you know, the language of, hum of human rights, but the, also the language of economics um, can be really confusing um, and, and, and not accessible at all. Um, and in thinking about like, you know, building common ground, I think economic justice activists and human rights activists are, are more or less on the same plane. You know, we are fighting for very similar things. I, I do think um, economic justice activists and human rights activists really need to grapple with what we mean by economic justice. I think too often, you know, the conversation becomes about reforming the, the current status quo. So it becomes about reformation and not transformation. And I think there is a danger in also co-opting the language of human rights without actually kind of structurally transforming our economies to meet human rights. Um, and this makes me think about, um, I get very excited about this because it makes me think about how, you know, we all talk about building back better, but you know what are we building back better? Is 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 it worth salvaging? Um, is it worth rebuilding what you know didn't work for most of us? And so I I agree with Jita Sen when she says you know it's about it's not about building back better. It's about moving forward differently. Um, so I think you know. In, in finding common ground between and building common ground between human rights and economic justice activists, I think, you know, we should first, it should be built on kind of the radical transformative agenda of human rights, it should be built on the radical transformative agenda of justice. Um, and it should focus on, you know, collectively, seriously learning from our histories, from our past, from our mistakes, um, and, and moving forward better. Thanks, Yvonne. Thank you, Sonia. Alison? Yeah, I'm probably going to echo a lot of what Sonia's already said. Um, yeah, I think to build common ground, to me, a really important starting point is just doing a lot more listening and learning um, and having these kinds of conversations. Um, as, as I said earlier, you know, there's been a tendency to really overemphasize the more legal um, dimension of, of human rights activism. Um, and that's been really focused a lot of energy around things like courts and then the UN and other kind of international bodies. And there's been a real you know, professionalization of human rights work that has meant that expertise has become um, all that rights has become a bit depoliticized in an, in an effort to, to, to increase their authority or, or their legitimacy. So there's that that's kind of become the dominant or the mainstream understanding of what human rights work is. But of course, in reality, human rights movement is incredibly broad and diverse. Um, and there's a lot more to learn in terms of the more radical ways that um, local activists and community groups and social movements are using rights to build power. Um, and, and in conversations we, we've had with, with these groups, you know, there's, there's, there's value in, in, in you know, people say seeing, seeing, seeing us ourselves as rights holders helps build collective identity for our movement. Um, it helps connect kind of local issues to broader national, regional and global trends. Um, helps to build alliances around shared values, some of the values that, that, that Sonia just shared. Um, and in some contexts, a, a rights framing can help validate demands that might otherwise be seen as too politically um, controversial. So thinking outside the kind of formal accountability um, channels that rights provide, what are the other ways that they help um, build power? And I think there's, there's a lot to learn around that question. Um, second, I think we need to do more work to strengthen the standards that have the biggest redistributive potential. Um, embarrassingly, I left off a really important one when I was talking about um, various standards, and that's the, that's the obligations that governments have to people beyond their borders. Um, so in, in jargon speak, um, that's called extraterritorial obligations. Um, but essentially, it's the idea that governments have duties to people out in, overseas when they have decisive influence um, over, 
over their their well-being and, and their their lives and livelihoods. Um, and so I think that speaks to, to Sonia's point about um, questions of, of global redistribution and redress for the injustices of the, the structure of the global economy. Um, and, and I do think part of part of the rights-based agenda for economic um, justice needs to be in, in, in decolonizing and transforming um, what those global structures look like. That said, I also think it's no coincidence that some of these norms that have the greatest redistributive potential are also the least developed and least widely championed um, amongst um, various actors within and outside the human rights movement. Um, you know, rights aren't immune from the political context in which they're being shaped and, and, and leveraged. Um, and at least at the international level, you know, with a lot of a lot of the shaping of these norms happened you know, in the you know, 70s, 80s and 90s, when there was a lot of political contestation about um, economic models and economic frameworks. Um, and I think I think there was a, you know, a mistake was to kind of try to appeal to everyone, um, try to appeal to both um, socialist and capitalist systems to like mixed and centrally planned and laissez faire economies. Um, and as, as a result, we kind of lost some of the, the analytical tools and, and that we could be using to make more rigorous critiques of how the economy impacts rights. Um, the, the third thing I wanted to say about for building um, common ground, Sonia's already covered about building up literacy and confidence to, to use rights to contest um, economic ortho orthodoxies. Um, we found a lot in our work, especially when dealing with international financial institutions, um, the message is, well, yes, of course, we want to invest more in rights, but we, there's no money, or if we do this, it will put the stability of the economy in jeopardy, and that, that often really shuts down the conversation, and, and there is a need for greater knowledge and skills to really interrogate this claim. You know, not to say we all need to become economists or we all need to become human rights lawyers, but um, the, the kind of through popular education and skill sharing, I think there's a lot more that could be done to really contest and challenge some of those deeply held beliefs um, about, about economics. Um, and the quite final thing I think that's really important is to present a, a clearer picture of what it looks like to center human rights in the economy especially socioeconomic rights. I think for us in the human rights um, field, we're often better at calling out things that we don't want uh, rather than describing things that we do want. Um, and so for us at CESR, a big focus of our work now is building on the video um, to and, and the report that it's based on to start fleshing out a fuller blueprint of what a rights-based economy could look like really to show tangibly and concretely what, how would the world be different? What would it look like um, if we centered rights in the economy? And in particular to show how it can make economic policy making more democratic, how it can um, an expected role um, of government um, in guiding economic, um, uh, economic activity, um, and also in really emphasizing that, you know, we ultimately can't secure rights for all until we achieve economic justice. I think that's the note I want to end on. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Alison. I think uh, these are really, really key things. We post also these, these questions in the chat. I don't know if uh, our participants want to say more about the experiences, because obviously all these uh, obstacles and these gaps and things is, is part of our daily day working and fighting for quality uh, and fighting inequality. So I think it would be great to hear from others what are the things, uh, the obstacles and, and the kind of discourse we, we often uh, face when we try to move forward our agenda for, for equality, our agenda for rights, for climate justice, for economic justice. <clears throat> and while people want maybe to share a little bit, uh, I think you both in these uh, questions brought a lot of things that are related to also accessibility. For example, you both mentioned this is really key because so often the legal jargon or the jargon in the different areas or fields could be an obstacle to bring other people that is the other people that are fighting anyway the same things but sometimes could feel alienated by the the way we express or we use obviously 
also uh, Alison, you mentioned exactly the things that related to when we build the legal framework to present a petition or to, to speak a little bit about um, the, the, the rights in the covenants, etc. Obviously, we use a lot of things, uh, but also it's the same for the economic field. You use a lot of things that are obviously the matter of a discipline, a part of studies, but it's a challenge, as you po both po posted, it's a challenge to frame this in a friendly way that is able or enabling way to let everyone to jump in and to contribute because uh, we are learning a lot also from the, the, the struggle from communities in every part of our world, bringing, being in the forefront of the fight against inequality. So that is, uh, is a challenge that you, you are mentioning in this uh, their part. Um, also, it's good, um, yes, as you mentioned, we are in a world that now in the COVID context, talking about building back better, but you both also mentioned already, uh, what about the systemic things? Uh, building back better, what, it, what is the meaning? Building back, again, the same things we had so far that brought us to this inequality world with a lot of uh, situations that we need to, to, to change or really taking this opportunity to move forward differently, as the sensei and everyone is in our our colleagues, our, our, our advocates are saying, it's, it's really a challenge because, because of the powerful actors shaping uh, the forces. But we as a community, uh, our world community have a lot of a lot of power too. And that's why you mentioned this is kind of the common ground, how to bridge these gaps and have the human rights as a powerful tool and build on these obligations, but also giving really meaningful about the daily life of people, what it means uh, about jobs, what it means in the public services, what it means getting education, what it means, uh, all that affects us in a, day, in a daily basis and to bring the human rights and the economic close to everyone to understand why we want to, to make this, uh, this common ground to fight together. So I don't know, uh, Kate is saying that is, she's agree, she agrees with the need to repolitize the rights and demystify them exactly as part of the things that also you, Alison and Sonia mentioned, because of course this historic, you mentioned this, this historic part. And if we don't tackle that part, it's kind of, the the rights the human rights will be neutral can't be neutral because we will repeat in the oppression and all the system that we know we want to fight against so i think is is all those things that you mentioned and kate is emphasizing here is is really important to also because sometimes we see this fear i don't know if you experience the same but this fear maybe in, in decision makers and in, in, in a lot of debates and the, in the political system in each country or globally, that they want to separate. The policy, like another thing differently with these issues are, are not differently. The way in the, in the all the policies are shaped and the system is shaped is about these issues and shouldn't be in a separate, in a separate way. So let's see. Um, if we have other reactions uh, about the, the the questions or about the interventions, I don't know. I would like to to have you both another another round to react a little bit on all the things you have been mentioning because we have a little bit uh, of time. Uh, I think five, maybe two minutes, two of you, and then I, I can wrap up and see if other of our participants are taking some other other contributions in the chat. So, Sonia? Um, yes, yeah, very important um, questions and conversations and themes that have been brought up. Um, and I see here there's, there's a comment in the comment section about, you know, what does a state exist for um, as part of repoliticizing rights? I think that's an important 
um, a po important point. I think we all need to think about, you know, what is the role of the state? Um, because we know that, you know, part of the neoliberal agenda um, or the mainstream economics agenda is to shrink the role of the state. And so how do we, you know, foreground um, the role of public services, of social public services? Um, and I mean, this conversation, you know, that we're having um, makes me, you know, think about kind of, you know, some of the values, the core values um, for fighting inequality. Um, in, um, Alison mentioned um, radical listening. I think, you know, at the core of defeating inequality, we should be espousing, you know, values of sharing, you know, feminist values about elevating community care and understanding, you know, that I am because you are and not simply about kind of self-interested human beings, you know, that, you know, that want to maximize their personal utilities um, as mainstream economics would have us believe. So, you know, foregrounding values of collective care, of collective ownership, um, and of thinking about our, our different roles in society in, in achieving that. Um, that will be my final contribution. Thanks, Eva. Thank you, Sonia. Alison? Yeah, to, to pick up two themes in the in the final discussion, um, Eva, your comment about the the kind of fear around taking policy decisions that are that are rights based. We often hear in conversations that involve like policymakers or policy influencers um, that they want to know. But yeah, but what do we have to do? What exactly do we have to do to 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 make sure that this policy is is rights compliant? And and I think that's. You know, sometimes that's a challenge of rights, but I think ultimately it's the strength of rights is that it's not prescriptive. It doesn't say exactly you need to invest 25% of your state budget in education um, or you need to provide income support of $100 a month for everyone. Um, it, it's, it, it sets the kind of scaffolding or sets the architecture for what the outcomes of policies should be. Um, and then it also talks about how policies should be made. So that was that was the idea I was trying to get at when I was talking about the kind of the bargaining and, and both the, the process of bargaining and the various um, bargaining positions that different groups are coming from. And, and to me, that's the real, in terms of thinking about rights as a tool for economic justice, it's really that, it's that mix of shifting power, democratizing decision-making and enabling communities and groups to have a voice in decisions that are affecting their lives and also strengthening the position that they have um, to be negotiating um, those discussions by setting some, some clear lines around you know, particular standards that we should, we should be meeting um, for, for everyone. Um, and yeah, and I think that also ties into this question of exactly what is what does the state exist for? It's, it, it, it nuances and enriches this discussion by by kind of or, or expanding and diversifying um, the the range of perspectives and voices that can help answer this question. So it's what's it for? What's its purpose? Rather than just a more kind of static, should it be big or small, should it be centralized or um, should it be free market? Um, and I think that's that's really critical questions that a rights framing can help us um, explore together. Well, thank you both, Alison and Sonia. We need to wrap up a little, our session, but of course, uh, repeat to everyone that the festival continues and is, is kind of uh, moving us uh, uh, about these discussions and bringing together to, to think more and to, to continue with, with, uh, with others working. But I think the, the main things we already mentioned, um, what you, you mentioned in your uh, interventions, but uh, I think the main things are, yes, how we bring in together these two fields we are able to learn from each other, from everyone working in these areas because we need it. We also need to uh, try to see how those actors making decisions, as you mentioned, know exactly what are we talking about. When, I, when we talked about economic justice, when we, not, when we talk about human rights, because so often they don't know, even if they have good intentions to do the right thing, sometimes they really don't know. But of course, as also a couple of things that you mentioned in this last part, 
uh, bringing the notion of the collective. Uh, you, you, you mentioned, Sonia, that the, the, the notion that the African uh, principle about I am because you are and we are all together. We cannot think in being fine if other next to me or in another part is not being fine, is, is struggling for their lives, is struggling to have a, a roof, is struggling to have food, to develop as a, as a human being. So we need to, um, with these discussions, I'm sure we are always advancing the way we frame it to advance a world in which collectively we can uh, um, advance, but also thinking not only in the human being, thinking in our nature, in the resources we need. And this is all what the, the climate justice movement are bringing, the feminist movement are bring, is bringing. So we need definitely to, to continue learning, but also being able to reach those making decisions, but also to challenge the way in the decisions uh, are made. As you also mentioned, these principles about accessibility, about participation, about democratic uh, system in which every person has the right to say and to participate and to shape the way they want for develop the community to, to the, and the country are where, wherever they are is really important. And, and also I think you, you mentioned the things that are not a recipe. Of course, we, 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 don't, we can't say this is the amount or this is the exactly way. This is part of a process in which uh, all the people have to participate and to be able to express and to shape the policies and to shape the mechanisms. And, I think that is a, uh, also, as you share, this is how human rights can, can help us to set the frame, to participate, to have participation, to have democratic system in which everyone have a say uh, in the way they want to develop their communities. Uh, but I think, yes, we need to continue educating ourselves and to be able to reach other actors and also to I, I would like to emphasize the things you mentioned about repoliticizing, uh, learning about our history, putting in the narrative the things about the oppression, the historic oppression, how the world has been shaped, because that story is what we are seeing today. And the system has been shaped in a way uh, that have uh, we have been seeing a lot of life uh, of people being really uh, damaged and uh, suffering a lot uh, because the system is shaped in this way. So we need to, to challenge that narrative. And I think both fields can also really help each other. And you have brought a lot of um, inputs about that on how we can shape this narrative to make others to understand what we want and for us to see what we want but being able to have this, this clear participation and this, this global connection uh, we, across the movements, across the agendas and, and learning from each other. I think that is, is, is part of the things that obviously your rich participation and contributions have brought, has brought here today. And I think all the people will be really uh, happy to continue the discussion. So I hope that the next sessions uh, are really good for people. And here also, Sonia, you are letting your, your details. I think we can obviously uh, be in contact and continue with, with other conversations uh, for advancing these agendas and from really strengthen our capacity to move forward uh, this agenda. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, everyone, and the interpreter, Anushka, for the technical support and the organizers for bringing this space to enable these conversations that are so much needed today. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining.